All right, we will start out. So um, my name is Phil Larson. I coordinate veteran and military services at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I am so happy to uh, welcome you all today to the session. Um, we have a great Veterans Week uh, lined up for you. We're about at the midway point today. So um, happy Veterans Day to all of our previous and current actual service members um, who are on the call uh, on the Zoom meet for us today. Um, uh, I will introduce our moderator and let them kind of take it away. So, John, if you want to, uh, if you want to start, and we will we will start this session um, with our distinguished author who we have with us today. So, uh, go ahead, John. All right, great. Well, thank you, Phil, and welcome everyone. I want to thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to help honor veterans during this uh, pandemically informed University of Michigan's Veterans Week uh, 2020. As I introduced, uh, I'm John Healy and I worked uh, in the facility section of student life. Uh, so although Michigan is an interior state of our country, it also has a very nautical heritage with more than 3,200 miles of coastline, uh -huh. second in the U.S. only to Alaska. Uh, Michigan here has 40 active ports, is able to move commerce internally via the, via the Great Lakes as well as the Atlantic Ocean via the St. Lawrence Seaway. So the Coast Guard has an extensive presence in Michigan with two Coast Guard sectors, two Coast Guard air stations, and more than 25 Coast Guard small boat stations. And there are undoubtedly many cases of heroism as Coast Guardsmen have ventured into the waters to protect and save mariners in distress. Thus, I am sure that those of us affiliated with Michigan are most interested and greatly appreciate the historic mm -hmm. Coast Guard rescue that took place off the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts in 1952. I am uh, super excited and pleased to introduce Mr. Michael Tagus, a New York Times bestselling author and co-author of more than 28 books, who discussed that particular case, which was the basis of a book, The Finest Hours. Uh, this book was later made into a major motion film that was released in 2016. Thus, with uh, no further ado, uh, please help me to welcome Mr. Michael Tagus. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining me. Um, I hope this presentation is like a documentary where I use a lot of slides from the actual rescue and I give you kind of a behind the scene look at what was happening. And in some cases, I know some of you maybe have seen the Disney movie based on the book, The Finest Hours, or will see it. And I'll, I'll mention where Disney departed from the real story and at the end, you know, when we have our uh, Q&A, I'd be happy to answer some of the, the questions. Um, the two stars in the movie were uh, Chris Pine and uh, Casey Affleck. And uh, I thought both of them did a good job. Authors, authors are invited to the movie set to watch, but we're not invited to comment. So it wasn't like I could go, cut, I want to do that over. Uh, but it, it was a, a thrill. And one of the, the rescuers, one of the four main rescuers was there for the filming, uh, Andy Fitzgerald. And that was, uh, that was fantastic. But to all the veterans who are listening, thank you for your service. And one in particular, Lydia Pinkham, I heard great things about and thank you for her volunteer efforts. So I'm gonna, um, get with the screen and um, bring the slides up. And I, I want to mention that I've done 30 books and um, everybody says, oh, will your next book be a movie? And I'm like, man, the stars have to align for something that lucky to happen. Um, I have a book about an untold story during the Cuban Missile Crisis where one of our pilots was shot down and killed over Cuba. And um, I thought that would make a great movie too, but it's so hard getting traction. So I, I've really learned to embrace what happened with the finest hours as a, as a bit of luck. Because let me tell you, every author thinks their particular book will make a great movie, and uh, it's um, it's luck. Don't uh, let anybody tell you any different. So I'm going to bring up my slides here, and we're going to go to the beginning. And so everybody can see the, the cover of The Finest Hours, I hope. Okay, the, um, this was an actual picture from the rescue and 
many of the photos I'm going to share with you uh, were taken either by the Coast Guard or in some cases, uh, citizens. And it just an amazing stroke of luck. Again, that pictures all the way from 1952 are so crisp and clear. Uh, they're all in black and white, but in a way it's even better. So this event happened in the winter of 1952 when two oil tankers split in half. Um, one was the Pendleton and the other the Fort Mercer. And in this slide, you see the dotted lines from where they drifted uh, when they broke apart where their names are down to the X and the X marks the spot of the rescued. So, you know, that was one of the reasons that pulled me right into this story when I first learned about it is, oh my God, how, what are the odds that two oil tankers would split an app on the same day, almost in the same location? So talk about being overwhelmed. The Coast Guard had to do uh, four separate rescues because you had the, the ships broken in two. So I thought I'd take each of the four rescues and give you a little um, glimpse into what happened. Now, if you do watch the Disney movie, they focus only on the Pendleton, which I think was the right idea. You don't want to confuse the audience by going back and forth, but I can take them one by one here. So we'll start with the Fort Mercer bow. And it was in rough shape. You can see there is no stern behind the wheelhouse. It's gone. And you had a casualty from right from the get go. Uh, one of the men was going up the catwalk to get to higher ground at the bow and he was swept, swept away. So although this is known as the Coast Guard's greatest rescue, there were many fatalities. And um, probably, you know, I'm going to mix in a few leadership uh, lessons that I pulled out. Probably one of the best decisions that the captain on the Fort Mercer, his name was Captain Patzel. One of his best decisions was even before the ship broke in half, he alerted the Coast Guard that they were in trouble. It wasn't a May Day, but he was alerting them of what, what was going on. And then when he was able to get out the May Day, the Coast Guard was kind of ready for it and zeroing in on that location. I've written six books about survival at sea and the accidents that caused them. And so many times the people wait until they're, they're in a May Day situation or beyond before telling the Coast Guard, hey, we've got an issue going on here. So, so it's always best to be a little bit ahead of the game. Even though you aren't issuing a May Day, uh, let people know you need help. And again, some of these lessons I talk about are good for our own lives when we're faced with a real challenge. First thing the Coast Guard did was send out these five young men from Nantucket. This was actually a mistake in leadership where the adrenaline of, oh my God, there's a ship going down, send all resources, was a big mistake because they were in a 36 foot boat. The waves are 40, 45 feet. Uh, there was no way they were gonna get 30 miles out to sea. And the only thing that saved their lives was they found this light ship, which is like a floating lighthouse all decked out in lights in a dangerous area. Had they not found that and been brought on board, uh, they probably would have perished. So the first rescue attempt does not succeed. And the second for the Fort Mercer came on day two of the rescue. So the seas have gone down a little bit, but they're big enough to cause problems. And the Yakutat arrives and they send over a life raft. Four men jump to get off that sinking tanker. All four miss the life rafts and are swept away. And I wondered why couldn't they just swim the 10 feet they had to go and crawl in. And one day I was doing this program two years ago and a woman in the audience said, that's my father standing up in the foreground of this slide on the Yakutat. I have a letter for you to read. And at the end of the program, I read the letter. And he said, when the four men jumped, a gust of wind hit the life raft and sent it tumbling about 25 yards away. So instead of you know swimming 10 feet, now they're in these heavy winter clothing and they can't make it the 30, 35 feet. 
So it, it, that does not show up in the book because that was something I learned after the book and I continue to put together little bits and pieces of the, of the puzzle. So the next step is they realize the life raft isn't working, so let's lower one of our launches. And, you know, for me, the real joy of these projects is not the writing, that'll always be hard, lonely work, but the research. And I was able to locate Gil Carmichael, who's standing at the stern of this launch. I found him down in Mississippi and we had some great discussions and he said, I was scared to death. He said, even though it's day two, the waves were still big. And um, our, our vessel was only 21 feet and we had to go over to the oil tanker. And he said, we were able to get two men who jumped, they hit the water and we pulled them in. But then a wave came and slammed us into the side of the oil tanker, causing the wooden ribs on our rescue boat to crack and now we're taking on water. So he said, it, there are still two men who wanted to jump from the tanker, two last men, but he had to, you know, kind of wave them off. No, 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 we, we're sinking ourselves. So this slide shows them going back to the mothership, back to the Yakutat. And if you look carefully, right in the center, there's one of the survivors under a white blanket. Um, the big issue is hypothermia and drowning, of course. And it was funny, I said to Gil, so what happened next? And he goes, I don't remember. And I go, why? And he goes, well, they lowered the block and tackle to bring us back up to the deck. And it hit me right in the head and knocked me out cold. He said, when I came to, I was in my bunk and my first thought was, I just had the coolest dream that I rescued two men off a sinking oil tanker. And the way he explained it was, he said, I didn't even put together that this was a real thing that happened to me until I went up on the deck and looked out and there's the oil tanker. And now we've gone back to sending rafts over because we can't use that little launch. And so they have two last men to get off. And you know, the, the way they send the rafts over is they shoot a line and those two men on the sinking tanker would pull it snug and tie the line off from the raft to the oil tanker. And then you'd have another end of the line going from the raft back to the cutter so they could pull them in. And the two men jumped and they were able to get in the life raft, but they were so hypothermic, they couldn't untie the line, the part of the line going back to the sinking tanker. So now they're stuck. And I, I found another Coastie who was on board the Yakutat. His name was Bill Blakely. And uh, I said to Bill, what'd you do? And he said, Mike, we had no choice. Uh, we had to put the cutter in reverse and hope the line snapped on the side towards the oil tanker. And he said, when we started to go slowly into reverse, the tension on the line caused the life raft to go way up in the air with these two men holding on for dear life. And he said, I couldn't even watch. He said the tension was unbearable. And then he heard a shout as the line snapped, thank God on the side towards the oil tanker. And he said, we pulled those men in as fast as we could. But he said they were so frozen stiff, they couldn't get out of the life raft. And he said, so we tied ropes around our waist, went down the scramble net, tied these two men to ourselves and brought them, brought them back up. So these were the last two men who were alive on the oil tankers. There, there were several casualties, uh, but they got the last two men alive off. And what was interesting is the, this photo is taken, the last man's being taken out of the raft, just as this is happening, somebody shouts, look, look, and they're, they're pointing back to the oil tanker and everybody looks and the Fort Mercer bow just rears up in the air. And it's amazing somebody was able to capture an image of it. I think the shot was taken from a circling aircraft. And I said to Bill Blinkley, did it flop right over? Cause it, you know, it has no second part, no stern. And he said, no, he said it, it went down like the Titanic. And it occurred to me, 
how lucky were those last two men that they were on board for 48 hours and just as they're being brought to the Coast Guard cutter, that's when the ship goes down. And, you know, when you're on whatever, it could be a ship, it could be a small sailboat. The rule of thumb is, you know, you never get into the life raft until you're stepping up, meaning your ship's got to really be sinking. But in these four books, and excuse me, the five books that I've written on this topic, you just never know when the boat's going to go down. And some people in one of my books, Overboard, they criticize the captain and the first mate of this small sailboat of leaving the vessel too soon. And I say, well, you might have done the same if a, if a 60-foot wave has capsized you and you're underwater and uh, the boat's filling. Um, but uh, you just never know. But these men were just incredibly lucky. Here is the last slide taken before it disappeared. So what about the stern section? A little bit better shape. You can see it's not at that steep angle. You'll see the twisted metal in the, the front there where the, the break was. And again, the joy was doing the research. I found Lynn Whitmore, who was the radio operator who got the SOFs. He's the gentleman standing up next to the man with the beard in the back. Lynn recently passed away. and. You know, as I think about it, most of the people I interviewed back around 2005 have passed away. So I'm so glad I, I put some things aside and just focused on this to get the eyewitness accounts and to become friends with some of these, these uh, courageous men. And Lynn said, we were on an icebreaker and I wasn't sure how how much help we were going to be able to be, but we did our best. And people assume I'm in the Coast Guard, but I never served. And so I asked Len, hey, how does an icebreaker break the ice? Does it ram it? And he goes, no, 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 no. You slide your bow up on the ice and the weight of the cutter breaks it. I go, what if the ice is five feet thick? He said, I'll send you a slide. And he said, we blow it up. And he said, then we put our bow up on that crack and it'll it'll break. So I was learning as I went, having never served in the Coast Guard, I think was an advantage because I'm writing the book for the general public. I don't use uh, uh, some uh, very technical terms. I want to keep it for the, the general public who just like a fast, fast paced read. That's always my mantra when I'm trying to write, keep it fast paced. So here is the East Wind arriving at the Fort Mercer Stern. They send over a life raft. Uh, the man doesn't have too, too far to jump, like on the bow section, maybe 10, 15 feet. But the way Lynn described it, he said, when we were pulling him back, a wave hit the life raft in such a way that it pushed the man up in the air like a pancake. He did a complete flip. And he said he landed right back in the life raft. And that's when we decided it's just too dangerous using the life rafts. And he explained this picture was as they're pulling them up and then they bundled them up again because of the, the hypothermia and the exposure and, you know, put them below decks. And then, you know, a smart move by the East Wind captain, his name was Captain Peterson, was to wait for a smaller cutter that you see in the distance there to arrive. That was the Akushnet out of Portland, Maine. And uh, so Captain Peterson on the bigger, the icebreaker, gives complete control to the smaller cutter by Captain John Joseph. And, I, and as you'll see, it turns out to be the right move. And I really like what Peterson did that. He recognized, you know, it's not about who gets the credit, it's about saving lives and he was more than willing to transfer that decision making to somebody of a, a lesser rank. So Captain John Joseph, uh, the way I the way I learned exactly what he did is I called every John Joseph in the country and um, finally found the right family and they said, oh, Captain Joseph passed away five years ago. And I was talking to his son and his son said, you know, my dad wrote an article for Reader's Digest and they never published it. Would you like it? And I'm like, yes. 
And it was 10 typewritten pages about exactly what happened. And he explained that he pulled up his uh, Akushna cutter right next to the sinking oil tanker. And even though, you know, one's going up and one's going down in the waves, men started to jump, timing their jump to the cutter. And John Joseph, who you'll see, I think he's in this next picture. There he is with one of the survivors. He said, everything was going fine until one man jumped, hit a patch of ice on our deck, slid right over to the other side and was hanging on by the rail. And he said, when the last 13 men on the sinking tanker saw that, they all shouted, we're not leaving. So they made a you know, a life and death decision, really, that their odds are better staying with the tanker than making the leap. And, you know, here's a little personal leadership lesson. The way I found the uh, eyewitness testimony for most of the survivors, because they had passed away back in 2005, was to go through local newspapers from 1952 all across the country, because each paper interviewed a survivor from their readership. And they were on microfiche. And at the time, I was holding down a, a corporate job in Boston, but I, I knew the position that I was in at that time was not suited to my strengths. And I said, I, I need to make a change. How am I going to do this? And finally, I came to the decision, use every available minute to to push the writing career forward by taking little steps. So I remember at lunchtime where people might gather together for a quick sandwich and bitch and moan about their jobs, I would run to the Boston Public Library, pull up a microfiche from a different newspaper, hit print, and then run back to the office. And I did that day after day after day. And I'm so glad I did because None of this would have happened if I didn't recognize, you know, my strengths aren't suited for where I am. I, I have to make a change. And so here's three of the survivors in borrowed clothing. But the last 13 men, one's on the upper deck there. You see him waving to the aircraft. He's basically saying, we're OK, we're OK, because on this stern section, they still had power. It's incredible that half a ship still has power. Uh, it was later towed to port. A uh, Coastie who was in Newport, that's where they towed it, said, I went out with the media because all the media was there and they wanted to interview these survivors. And we thought they'd be frozen and half dead when this was towed in. And he said, when we climbed up the Jacob's ladder, those 13 men welcomed us in the galley with a, a bacon and eggs breakfast. <laughs> so they had the ability to stay warm, to cook. And the lesson for me is if I'm ever on a ship, stay on the stern section. They stay afloat much longer than the bow. And time and time again, I come across that. So now moving to the Pendleton and Disney, they said, let's just focus on the Pendleton because that kind of has a, a clear hero. And I could understand the, the simplification. So in the Disney movie, you'll just hear the Fort Mercer name come up once as they allude to another tanker in trouble. Here's the, the Coast Guard station way back at the period. And here it is today. And um, I speak at Coast Guard, usually air stations across the country. And I was speaking at one and I showed these two pictures. I said, there it is. and the 1940s and 50s, here it is today. And they all burst out laughing. I said, why are you laughing? And they said, it just goes to show how much of the resources we get in the military <laughs> that we get them last, that our station looks the same as it did in 19, uh, 1952. But Disney was able to do some of the filming here and they put up snow guns to make it look like a blizzard. Um, so in that respect, it was fortunate. So when Chatham Station learns, and Chatham's at the elbow of Cape Cod, you'll see a map coming up, learns that the Pendleton has split in half. This commanding officer has a tough decision. Now, when you watch the Disney movie, they make him out to be kind of this hard-nosed, 
uh, uh, what can I, I don't know. I don't know if they, if villain is the right word, but he doesn't come across as very likable. But in actuality, his, his two choices are bad. You know, if he sends out his rescue boats, they're only 36 feet and into this storm where the waves are bigger than the boats. And, and if his men die, everybody's going to say, what were you thinking? But if he does nothing and people on the Pendleton die, they're going to say the same thing. So he's got a difficult choice. And he sends out um, the first group led by Donald Bangs in this photo in the light colored hat. And uh, a little aside and another little leadership point, uh, the hero who you'll meet in a minute, Bernie Weber, kept saying to me, Mike, are you going to put Donald Bangs in the book? And I would say yes. And probably like the third time Bernie asked me that, I said, why do you, why do you care so much about De Donald Bangs in the book? And I remember Bernie going, I love that man. He was my mentor. He got no credit for this rescue, but what he did uh, was incredible. And um, it made me realize that everybody, in this, particularly when you're younger, should look for a mentor. And, and Bernie, oftentimes in our discussions, would mention Donald Bangs. And Bangs went out at night to the Pendleton Bow, which you see is in tough, tough shape. One man jumped. They couldn't get him. It's dark. They lost him. And nobody else came out. And we know Captain Fitzgerald was on this section of the ship and five others, but they never showed themselves. So, you know, had I been in bang shoes, I would have got the hell back to safety. But he stayed out there all night, uh, circling the ship, hoping to rescue somebody. But nobody else came out. And it will always be a mystery what happened to Captain Fitzgerald. So in this old map from 1952, uh, you see Chatham Station at the top of the screen. Monomoy Island is that big land mass, uh, skinny land mass going from north to south to the bottom of the screen. I'm, I'm often out there on a boat fishing, and today that's covered with seals, which has brought in the great white sharks. So 25 years ago, it was a rarity to have great white sharks around. Now, boy, they're everywhere. But I, I use this map to show you the approximate location of the Pendleton Bow and Stern. And it was they were both near the letter K, the Stern being a little closer to shore. And that's the section that this man has to go out to, uh, Bernie Weber. So Bernie was the key person in this story. Um, he did not want to work with me in the beginning at the book, and that was a, a good lesson for me in persistence, uh, staying with him until, until I was able to convince him. And later, if you're interested, I could tell you why. But Bernie um, said, when they told me I had to go out to the bow, he said, uh, Mike, I thought they were sending me on a suicide mission. This made no sense to me at night, a 36 wooden boat, and we have to go over the Chatham Bar, which is this shallow area where these big giant rollers are going to break. And, he, he, you know, what I liked about Bernie was that despite his fear, and he readily recognized his fear, he wasn't incapacitated by it. So, you know, I, I often think the best and the brightest and the most courageous, it's not that they have an absence of fear, it's that they have the fear, but they're still able to function and they rather readily admit they're afraid. And that's that's what Bernie did. And I also came to the conclusion that heroes are not born, they're made, because in the Finest Hours book, I talk about a rescue Bernie worked on a year earlier, and it was a terrible failure. And it really weighed heavily on him, but but he learned from it. So again, you you can evolve, and and he certainly evolved. And few people knew that the Coast Guard's greatest hero, Bernie Weber, was in a failed rescue mission just a year before this. And Bernie said, "I was lucky. I did not have to pick a crew." He said, three men volunteered." 
Two of them are in this photo. Barney's on the left. In the middle is Richard Livesey. And on the far right is Andy Fitzgerald. Uh, Richard, I spent a lot of time with. He was retired down in Florida. Andy Fitzgerald was lucky enough to be there for the filming of the movie. And the third man who is not in this photo, you'll see a picture of him later, was uh, Irvin Mask from Wisconsin. And they all volunteered. So they, they could have kept their mouth shut because they're thinking it might be a suicide mission, but they didn't want to leave Bernie standing there alone and having to pick people from the crew. So the issue for Bernie was his vessel was up at the pier at the top of the screen, and he knows he's got to get over the bar to even get to the stern. So like so many of the, the best rescuers and the best survivors I've researched, they only take it, you know, one half hour at a time or maybe one hour at a time. They don't try to see every little step down the road because they'll get overwhelmed and they'll think we'll never pull this off. Um, so they're really focused on the now and his focus, Bernie's was, how do I get over the Chatham bar? I got to time this just right. And I said, how are you going to find the stern? And he said, Mike, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was thinking of just get over the bar because I've got these orders that I have to go. Um, so he took it one step at a time. So he left from the fish pier and they're going through calm water. And this is probably my favorite part of the movie. And it reminds me of the movie Jaws. Recall at the beginning of the Jaws movie, you don't see the shark, uh, but you hear the dum 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 dum, the music. And to me, that part was scarier than later in the movie when you see the shark. And the same thing here, Bernie's going through calm water. And in the movie, the crew just hears in the distance, boom, boom. And it's the waves breaking on the Chatham bar. And they know that's where they've got to go. And Richard said it was uh, so frightening to just hear that booming. I said, what'd you do? He said, I started to sing. And I said, that's, that's an odd response. And he goes, no, it was to calm my nerves. And he said, the other three guys joined in. I said, what'd you sing? And he said, Rock of Ages. <laughs> and um, they didn't include that in the movie, but that's what they did to calm their, to calm their nerves. So again, it, the fear's there, but it hasn't incapacitated them. They're still trying to do their best. And this is the vessel they were in, the 36500. So Bernie would be standing behind the windshield. That's where the wheel is. You'd probably have two men in the forward compartment near the survivor's uh, uh, compartment in the front. And there are, there are pictures of them leaving and going out, but because this is occurring at night on the day of the, uh, the splitting of the tankers and the blizzards, um, you don't have photos. So, I, I contacted some of my Coast Guard uh, friends and I said, could you send me a photo of what it might have looked like, you know, as they went out from the pier and had to get across the bar? And this is what they sent me uh, from the West Coast. I said, is that the Columbia Bar? And I recall they said, no, it was a different one. I can't remember which. But uh, look what, this is a bigger vessel than Bernie's. This is the 47 foot motor lifeboat. Look what happens to it. Uh, it just gets engulfed by the wave. You see the tip of the bow at the top and totally rolls over. Now, thankfully, the seven Coasties on board, the men and the women had surf belts on, so around their waist would clip to a firm point in the vessel. It's a self-riding boat, so when the vessel finally came right side up, they were still with it rather than killed on the rocks and they all survived, but there was one uh, serious injury. And I said to Bernie, is this what happened to you? And he said, no, no, no. And he said, if it did, we'd all been dead. He said, there were no surf belts. So if I go back and pretend this is Bernie's vessel approaching the bar, he said, our first try, 
the waves broke on us and took out the windshield. And he said, so much water came into the cockpit that it swept the compass right off its mount in a way. And so I'm wondering how the heck they're going to find the, the tanker if they don't have a compass. And I probably would have had it in, but Bernie, and again, he never said this to me, so this is speculation on my part, but I think that failed rescue is weighing heavily on him, and he's thinking, I can't, I can't let this happen again. So he gives it another try. They lose engine power. Uh, luckily, Andy Fitzgerald is able to go down into the survivor's compartment and um, or the engine room and get it restarted. And then Bernie said, I just gave it full throttle and we kind of went through the top of the wave like a submarine. And then I'm thinking, how the heck are gonna, they gonna find the oil tanker? And Bernie said, put it in the book what I'm telling you. I think I was guided by a higher power because so many strange things happened that night that cannot be explained. For me, he said, that's the only explanation, put it in the book. But I'll take you to what happens next. They do find the oil tanker, and down comes the Jacob ladder. Uh, Andy told me, he said, these men wanted off that tanker so bad, they thought it was going to go over at any moment. And he said, sometimes they would jump and land right on the bow. Sometimes they'd land in the water, and we'd pull them in. And Richard said, you know, Bernie couldn't just hold the vessel near the ladder because a wave would slam us into the steel hull. So he said, we'd have to kind of do a little loop and come around again, get two or three more, then come around again over and over. And when he gets to, you know, say 20 survivors on the boat, this little rescue vessel is riding so low in the water, Bernie's wondering, how am I going to get back in? Uh, it's sluggish. We're, we're going to capsize if we take on any more. But he decides he'll never get back out again. And he doesn't even know if he'll get in. So he decides it's going to be all or nothing. Uh, he can't leave what he thinks are five more men up on the oil tanker. Um, but he's wrong about the number five. In total, there were 33 men on this section of the ship. So they keep coming off one after the other. Everything's going well. They get to the, let's see, be the 32nd man, Tiny Myers, who, uh, who was a funny nickname because he was six foot three, 300 pounds. He comes down and just like in this sketch, Irvin Mask and Andy had a hold on him but it was on the other side of the rescue boat towards the oil tanker and they didn't have the strength to pull him in because he's such a large man and one of the waves came and slammed the oil tanker and the lifeboat together crushing tiny mires in between now it, when you watch the disney movie you don't see this part because they wanted to keep the pg-13 rating so kids could watch the movie. So they just show Tiny Myers jumping and sinking down in the waves. But what really happened is he was he was crushed. And I remember Andy saying, Mike, you know, I don't consider this a successful rescue because I still have nightmares of holding on to Tiny Myers in his face just two feet from my own and we couldn't get him in the boat. But, you know, Bernie can't look for his body because there's still one man coming down. And in the movie, that's played by Casey Affleck, who did a nice job. It's kind of an understated role. You know, he wasn't the captain of the ship. He was uh, the chief engineer. So when it split in half, the captain was on the other half. He then became the de facto captain. And he's not used to leading men. So when you see the movie, I thought he did a, a great job. Uh, same with Chris Pine, who plays Bernie Weber, this uh, reluctant hero, humble hero is probably a better word. But they get him. They get that last man. So now they've got 32 men, survivors, plus a four-man crew. So think of that. 36 people in total on a boat, only 36 feet in length. Talk about packed. 
and I wondered uh, what happened next. So I'm, you know, I'm walking Bernie minute by minute through. I said, so what'd you do next? And he said, I got on the radio, told, uh, announced that I've, I've got 32 survivors on board. And then he said, then the radio exploded. I said, it blew up. And he goes, no, no, no. He said, it exploded with advice. Everybody's telling me what to do. He said, a cutter is saying, come further out to sea. And I'm thinking, I don't want to do that. He said, Coast Guard Station Boston is telling me one thing. Clough is telling me another. I said, what did you do? And he said, I turned the radio off. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, it was making me nervous. And, you know, in retrospect, it was a smart thing to do. He got in trouble for that, by the way. But who, who better to know what move to make next than the person who's on scene, rather than being micromanaged by people who are in the safety of an office. So he shuts the radio off right on his commanding officer and decides, I am just going to follow the seas. Uh, they were coming at me when we went out, and now I'm going to follow them in. And again, he says, I, I don't think it was any skill on our part, but a giant wave picked us up and put us over the Chatham bar. Maybe the tide had come up, so it was a little gentler. But um, he said, I, I'm not even sure how we found the Chatham Bar, but we did. And he said, I knew we were safe because we went from 60 foot seas to you know five or six foot seas. And here they are coming back. The whole town is at the pier, by the way, because they've been listening to radio reports. And they're thinking, oh, what a shame. You know, the, they've only rescued one man. They've been out for three hours. But <laughs> when the... Uh, Hatch to the survivors compartment opens, out come all these men and the people in town can't believe it. And, you know, I don't know how they got so many men on that vessel and in the compartment, because you could see here the, uh, the life jackets they wore back then were really big and bulky, made of cork and canvas on the outside. And then my favorite photo of all is coming up everybody left and Dick Kelsey took this picture of Irvin Mass standing below and Bernie up high and you can just see the relief in Bernie that it's over. Uh, you know just the way his hand is limp and the other hand is holding his head um, he's still kind of in shock. Now the Disney movie they have this as kind of like the end scene that Bernie reunites with his fiance right at the uh, the cockpit of the 36500. But th there's really more to the story, and I'll, I'll wrap up with these last few slides. Uh, their, their picture, they're back, these are the four rescuers back at the station. Their picture's going out across the country by the Associated Press. Bernie's on the left, I like to joke, you know, even a hero makes a mistake. He forgot to zip up his fly for the big picture. <laughs> and, and luckily, Bernie had a sense of humor. So he put up with my uh, jokes. And the, the rescuers, are, they're at the Coast Guard Station, too. So some of them are collapsed. Uh, there's newspaper photographers there, radio reporters doing live interviews. Um, everybody I found who was there, like Ed Semprini, this radio man, he said it was pandemonium. He said uh, there are so many people crammed in there. Some of these survivors just from the sudden heat were passing out. And I said to Bernie, how cool to be called, uh, you know, America's hero. And he said, not really. He explained that being a hero became a burden. And of course, I asked why. He said, um, one, I was going to make a career out of the Coast Guard. So when I went to a new station, sometimes there was jealousy. And he said, rightfully so, I got all the attention. Other people did rescues, probably just as difficult. But he said, the Coast Guard had me go around to rotary groups and travel around the country because I was there as he said it, like their poster boy for recruiting. And he said, I had to do all these ceremonies. And he said, Mike, I'm only 24 years old. So I'm, I'm very uncomfortable being put in front of a crowd and introduced as the Coast Guard's greatest hero. He said, I, I, the experience was bad. And part of that 
uh, you know, stayed with him well into his 80s when he didn't really want to talk with me about the rescue at first. Uh, so there, there was that section of the Pendleton Bernie did the rescue on the, it, it did roll over on a shoal and it stayed there up until the blizzard of 78 when it broke apart. But um, people could climb on board and take pieces off. I wish I had done that, but um, I, I wasn't a big fisherman back in 1978 like I am now. And then finally, you know, we talked about Donald Bangs at the bow section and that the captain of the Pendleton never showed himself. I found the Coastie who was uh, charged with get out there and remove the bodies, get the captain's bodies and the other. And his, his name was Mel Guthrow. Uh, turns out he lived right in the same town as me. So talk about fate. I spent a lot of nice days with Mel. He was another great coast. He was since passed away, but so helpful. These are his photos. Mel said the seas were calm. It was three days later. He said, I figured I'd, you know, pull the rescue boat up to the the bridge, which was all twisted and broken. And he said, there was nobody in it, no bodies, no nothing. I asked him, what did you do? And he said, I, I did have a little flashlight. He said, I went through the bowels of the ship and ended up at the very tip of the bow where paints had been stored. And he said, there under some burlap bags was one sailor frozen into a block of ice. And I said, where'd you find the captain? And he said, Mike, there were no others. I searched every inch of the ship. I said, what do you think happened to the captain and the, the five, the four others? And he said, I don't know. He said, they could have been swept right out of the bridge or off the catwalk. Maybe they had a small uh, lifeboat that they put over in the storm and capsized, but their bodies were, were never found. And it'll be the one the one piece of the finest hours will never know exactly what happened. So that the original rescue boat was found in total disrepair by the Salt Pond Visitor Center on Cape Cod. And a gentleman recognized it. He said, that's the 36500, that's Bernie Weber's boat. And he was able with uh, the Orleans and the Chatham Historical Society to raise funds and repair it. And it, it's at Rock Harbor. So if you're ever on Cape Cod in the summer, Rock Harbor's in Orleans, you can see it. And, and if there's a volunteer there, you can go on it. And you'll just marvel how the hell did Bernie maneuver this with 36 men all over. You know, they were around his feet, hanging on for dear life because they're in those giant seas. And the um, the propeller from the original rescue boat is on a boulder overlooking the Chatham Bar. And if anybody's interested, um, I have uh, the books on my website. Um, and if you'd like them to say for a Christmas gift, when you order, there's a way to um, tell me how to inscribe it if it's a gift to a certain person. And some of the other books I mentioned are there too about the the Cuban Missile Crash, this pilot and Kennedy, uh, his decision making during that event. But I, I wanted to close with one last story about Bernie that, that I thought was the real, the, the primary leadership lesson that I learned. And that was um, remaining humble and thinking of others. So what Bernie did is interesting. Three days after the rescue, he gets a call from the commandant's office. I don't know if it was the commandant himself. I wish I had asked, but whoever it was says, Weber, we're going to award you the gold life-saving medal, the, the highest honor there is. We're going to give your crew the silver. We're going to have the ceremony in Boston on such and such a date. And Bernie, of course, goes, thank you very much, sir. And um, the way Bernie explained it, he said, I finally said, hey, you know, the crew volunteered, they should get the gold. And they said back to Bernie, too late, you know, here's how the ceremony is going to go. And Bernie said, I'm about to hang up the phone and it just didn't feel right. So I said, I can't accept. And they go, what are you talking about? 
And he goes, if you don't give the crew the gold, I'm not going to accept it. And incredibly, he called their bluff. And at that ceremony, all four of those men got the gold life-saving medal. So it was just a great example into Bernie's character that he wasn't about hogging the glory. And um, he wanted to, to share that praise with those men who volunteered to go with him. And I'll stop my uh, screen sharing. And if people have questions or comments, we can take it from there. Um, I'll go, whoops. Uh, there's a there's a spelling of the last name T O U G I A S. Okay, great. I see uh, from Kirk a thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Janet. I too would like to thank you, Michael. Maybe to. I'll ask a few questions and maybe uh, some others can uh, think of some and join in. Yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, you had mentioned is was that Bernie uh, was uh, reluctant to chat with you eventually. And you mentioned if we had time, uh, you could uh, kind of uh, inform us of what eventually turned him to uh, be more of uh, cooperating with the research required for your book. It's um. It's a, I love the story because there's a little bit of humor in it. And again, um, it shows sometimes being persistent can work. So when I first called Bernie, he was very polite. And um, but he said, thank you very much. But no, thanks. Uh, I don't want to relive this. Um, too many people have got the story wrong and nobody cares about it from 1952. And I'm like, oh, God. I knew I couldn't, without Bernie's cooperation, I knew I couldn't do the book. So after we hang up, I'm thinking, what do I do? And I said, well, I know I'll send them. I did a book about a rescue, a Coast Guard rescue that was not a, a success that happened in the blizzard of 1978. Um, I sent them that book, 10 Hours Until Dawn. And then I waited a month and then I called him back and I said, Bernie, did you get the book? He goes, yes. I go, did you like it? He goes, yes. I go, will you work with me? He goes, no. <laughs> and I go, why? And he goes, Mike, I just don't want to do it. I, it's, I just don't want to relive it in this whole hero business. So I'm like, oh God, what do I do now? So I sent him another book about a rescue and survivors, fatal forecast. And I wait a month, I call him back. You like the book? Yes. Will you work with me? And this time he goes, maybe. He goes, let's do it as a trial and see how things go. And um, it went it went well. Um, but what was funny is years later, after Bernie had passed away, I was with his daughter and I said, boy, in the beginning, your father was kind of tough on me. And uh, I thought he was this kind of gruff man at first. You know, later we developed a friendship and I said, why did he give me such a hard time? And he goes, she goes, uh, Mike, I know all about that because every time you called him, he would call me and say, this guy, Michael Togus is still calling me up. What do you think I ought to do? And she said, he finally called, said, I decided to work with him because if nothing else, he's persistent. <laughs> so, so, you know, thank God that I kept trying uh, or the book would have never happened. Maybe I'll ask another quick question before uh, somebody else can chime in. Is uh, certainly the Disney movie, uh, there was a love interest there. Was that true or not true, or how did that come into play? It was true. It was a little bit out of sequence because by the time of the rescue, they were already married. But um, he did have this really uh, kind of fairy book tale romance with Miriam. And um, when I sat with his daughter, Patty, during the premiere, she whispered to me, the actress whose name was uh, Holiday Granger, she goes, that is just how my mom would have talked. <laughs> so she did nail that part. Very nice. I'll uh, go to the floor here or Phil, if anybody else has any questions. Someone asked, I saw a chat question come up about how long it took to write the book. And this was much longer than normal because back then I was holding down a day job. So I was moonlighting doing the research. So 
I want to say a good four years and the last few months was bringing on board the co-author uh, to help move it, move it along. Michael, I have a, I have a question. I'm, I, I'm not sure how to phrase it actually. So maybe this is a good thing to elaborate on is I deal a lot with, uh, with veterans and, and, and military folks. Uh, I'm a vet myself. I would get this word hero tossed around a lot. Um, I look at these men and, and certainly, you know, Bernie, others who went out, but even, you know, some of the guys that are on the ships, right. That were, they were in peril. Right. Um, you talk about the, 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 uh, the, the, the chief engineer had to take on, you know, kind of the role of leader and actually do it. I mean, hero um, in, a, in the big H word, I guess, the capital hero right. with the capital H. What, what do you think caused that? Like what, how, how did they become, how did they decide in that moment to volunteer? How did they decide to go ahead and risk their lives? How, did you get a sense of that while writing the book and talking with the, the they sound like pretty humble people. Mm -hmm. Where did that spark come from that they were like, yeah, I'll do it. Send me in coach kind of thing. Each one of those three that volunteered to go with Bernie kind of had a different reason. Um, Irvin Mask was the first to say, I was unaware of how bad it would be. He said, because I, I, I wasn't even part of the Coast Guard station. He said, I was stationed on a light ship and just happened to be there. So I figured I'd volunteer. He didn't know what he was getting into. And he said, although Bernie called it a suicide mission, he said, I never thought that uh, because I'd seen Bernie at the Chatham bar, not in weather as bad as this, but he was, he, boy, if anybody could handle a, a vessel, he could. And uh, Richard Lipsy was more out of loyalty to Bernie. They were very close. And he said, I couldn't let him go without me. I had to, to step up. But I, I do think the term hero is totally overused these days. Thanks. You know, if it's part of your job and you're doing it, I don't think you should be called a hero. That's what you're being paid to do. But when you go beyond the line of, OK, what's in your job? and what's well above and beyond, like three times to get over that Chatham bar and you don't have a compass or a windshield. Whereas if um, say I'm, I'm out taking a walk and somebody falls on a railroad track and the train's coming and I just pull them to the side, I'm certainly not a hero. I didn't do anything anybody else wouldn't do. Um, but it's when you kind of know you're putting your life on the line and it's not part of your job uh, that's when I would say you you meet the big H, as you said. Were there any any final questions or, or comments? It's so fun to see the slides, uh, particularly on my part, when I haven't seen them for a while, and to have those memories come back of interviewing each one of those people. How do you feel? I, I have a question for you because we've talked a lot about the event, really. For you as a writer and as a person, how has this changed you interviewing these, these folks and, and researching this event? Has it changed you and your outlook? I, I think each time I interview someone who, who's exceptional, um, for example, in Fatal Forecast, this man survives in the North Atlantic in nothing but a pair of jeans in late November, tumbling in a life raft when a rogue wave sank his vessel. You can't help but take, have a few takeaways of how did you do it when I would have given up? I would have been just sobbing and give up. And you, so from each one, I learned something different. And from that one, his name was Ernie Hazard. For example, I learned the power of little steps. He kept saying, what can I do to make my situation better? and he'd do some little thing. It might be just moving into a different position, and then he'd give himself a pat on the back to keep his spirits up. So I'm kind of absorbing all this for you know any kind of challenge I face. And I, and I hope to do a future book on that called Extreme Survival. What, what did I learn from these people who do something that most of us could have never pulled off, and how? Not the physical part of it, but the mental part.
Um, so that, that's that been the, the change in me. I, I hope I've absorbed some of that. Somebody had a really good question. I lost it. Um, enjoy research, incredible story. Uh, thank you again. Oh, um, I, I think you covered a little bit, just the great lessons. What are, what are some of the great lessons you took away from this? Yeah, yeah, just that, you know, the humbleness of, of Bernie and not trying to hog the glory. Um, today, everybody, it seems, is tooting their own horn a little bit too much, and, and he remained humble. And so many people, um, like his own neighbors where he lived in Florida, they didn't know he had ever done this rescue because he never brought it up, you know. He just kept it quiet. But the Coast Guard remembered they uh, did two, a couple things. A big mural of the rescue was at the Coast Guard Academy. And then just recently, they named a cutter uh, the Bernard C. Weber. Very cool. Yeah, that was nice. Were you there at the dedication for that? I was not there. It was in, um, in Miami. I heard it was a, a great event. And um, little bits and pieces of the rescue still surface of, uh, you know, connections people had. I met somebody who was at the dock when Bernie came back in. And uh, yeah, he had the same thing of, oh, wow, they didn't get any survivors. What a shame. <laughs> Lots of thank yous I saw in the chat. So right. make, sure, make sure you go to uh, Michael's website. If you're interested in getting this book, I would recommend it. Um, I would also recommend the Disney movie. I, I enjoyed the movie quite a bit. Um, and, and when we'll actually show, it's on the docket to show my two. I have a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old boy. And they are interested in Coast Guard work uh, uh, because I, I've, as a service member, I was like, you want to look at, at work? The Coasties do a lot of work, uh, undermanned, underpaid, and uh, they do stuff every single day of the year all the time. And uh, I, I don't think they get enough credit military service uh, for what they do day in and day out to, to both keep us safe and to rescue people who uh, get in a bad situation. So. Yes. Yay, Coasties, and I'm glad that we were able to uh, highlight at least some of their service uh, today. I'm um, very happy about that, and thank you for being yeah. here today. Yeah, and thank you to all those veterans. Uh, keep us safe. Much, much appreciated. So, John, do you want to close close this out real quick? Uh, sure. So, yes, Michael, uh, as you see by the comments, a wonderful presentation. Uh, we sincerely thank you for uh, spending an hour or so with us to uh, – inform uh, the greater University of Michigan community here some of the fine things that the Coast Guard has done and uh, sincerely appreciate uh, you, you spending time with us and it was an excellent presentation so thank you. And John, John thank you for all the time you put into organizing it and the dates and the time and and reading my newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> no, my uh, pleasure. Okay. Thank you all. Nice to meet you all. Hope to see you in person sometime. Excellent. All right. We'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you. Stay Goodbye. safe, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John, very much for doing this. I appreciate it. All right. It. Thanks, Phil. Thank you all. Bye-bye.